Um, welcome, I was saying, and thank you all for attending. We are very lucky to have this evening as our speaker, Dr. Rory Naismith. Uh, and as you may know from the publicity which has been given to this lecture, he is lecturer in history, in the history of England, before the Norman conquest in the Department of Anglo-Saxon, Norse and Celtic at Cambridge University. And he's also a, a fellow of Corpus Christi College. He's written a great deal widely on early medieval England, including his two, 2018 book, uh, Citadel of the Saracens, The Rise of Early London. The talk this evening has the intriguing title, wonderful title, it sounds to me straight out of 1066 and all that. And the title, as you probably know, is Guilds and Things, Keeping the Peace in 10th Century London. And that will take us right back to the bedrock of our common law and the roots of the system. After 1066, we know that the conqueror claimed to be the lawful successor of Edward the Confessor. And he did have some claim through his mother, who was herself a Norman. And um, through, uh, I, I'm sorry, Edward the Confessor's mother, who was herself a Norman. And Edward the Confessor was brought up partly in Normandy. So there was a connection, and it may be that Edward himself wanted his successor to be the conqueror, but of course that didn't happen without the conquest. So he posed as the lawful successor of Edward the Confessor, and we know from that great authority, uh, F.W. Maitland, who was um, probably the foremost legal historian of his day at, at Cambridge and Downing Professor, that the two things that are definitely known about the Normans are that uh, William the Conqueror said, uh, and there is a statute to this effect, this I will and order, that all shall have and hold the law of King Edward as to lands and other things with these additions, which I have established for the good of the English people. So although he'd conquered us, he wasn't seeking to impose any different law. And then of course, after William the Conqueror, there was the rule or misrule of Rufus. And after that, Henry I succeeded and Henry I too confirmed what the conqueror had said. I give you back, he said, King Edward's law with those improvements whereby my father improved it by the counsel of his barons. So they were keen to preserve that continuity. And the great contribution of the Normans and their successors was to extend the law to the whole of England, which it hadn't been until the conquest, and then uh, to, to establish it as the common law of England. And so uh, it's changed, of course, with changing conditions uh, in the world then and ever since. But if you go back to the beginning or want to go back to the beginning, it is back to Anglo-Saxon England and for the conquest. So uh, that is an introduction to um, Professor Naismith's talk, uh, to Dr. Naismith's talk, and I will hand over without more ado. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Master. Um, I hope everyone can hear me all right. Do alert me if, if there's any problem. Um, I'm just going to switch on my uh, share screen so you can see the slides I have put together, um, which I hope you can indeed see. Again, 
alert me if it is not cooperating. Okay, so guilds and things, uh, that title will make a bit more sense as I go on, keeping the peace in 10th century London, uh, which you can see a map of as a background there. This is actually the earliest known attempt at a map of Anglo-Saxon London. Um, it's meant to represent about the year 1000. It was made in 1810 by a guy called William Darton, who was a specialist publisher of maps and children's books. Um, there's a lot about it that is uh, not entirely accurate. We don't think there was a, an Episcopal palace or uh, the Temple of Diana, uh, all sorts of things like that are more, um, let's just say more of the result of imagination than, than, than uh, archeological and historical research. Nonetheless, it's a very beautiful and evocative thing. And I've used it here just as a background to set the scene a bit. Now, if I were speaking to you in person, we'd be situated near the Strand in the pleasant environs of the Temple Church and the Law Courts, um, an area of the city full of history, one of those that preserves very well its medieval character, um, dating back to long before the Great Fire, and the Blitz for that matter, and persisting imp impressively despite the ravages of the centuries coming in between. We'd be sitting roughly on the boundary of the City of London, City with a capital C that is, and Westminster, both of which are names to conjure with uh, from a historical point of view, and especially a medieval point of view. Going back a little further, uh, we would also be sitting in what was a sort of no man's land, between the two centres of early medieval or Anglo-Saxon London. Um, now, uh, in fact, we'd be sitting probably right up by the shore of the Thames, which was wider and shallower at that point. And not only would we be getting wet from the lapping waves on one side, but underfoot, we would feel the, the squelch of what was called London Fen. Um, this was an area of marshy land extending either side of the mouth of the fleet. Um, and we know about it from descriptions of the boundaries of land that was held by the Abbey of Westminster from the, the later 900s. This was emphatically not the heart of a big city. Um, but if we were to lift our gaze from the mud into which we were sinking and look to the west, we would have looked down the Strand, which probably already existed as a riverside path at this point, towards what was called Londonwich. You can see it on the map here. Uh, now, Londonwich was a new urban settlement that emerged in the 7th century, the 600s, situated in the area between Trafalgar Square and Lincoln's Inn Fields. Relative to other settlements of the day, London, which was a major concentration of population, production and trade. But we need to keep its, its status and its, its physical character very much in perspective. In a lot of ways, it was very important in economic terms. It really was a sort of permanent rotating craft fair come car boot sale. An agglomeration of maybe five to seven thousand people at any one time living in what was effectively to our eyes, a shanty town of wooden buildings um, with little to nothing in the way of public spaces or buildings. Um, it was a very no nonsense, functional place, uh, more a permanent market than a town as we would understand it in institutional terms. And there's very little evidence that it had much of a sort of communal character identity. It was just a place where different networks of trade and, and elite influence intersected. Still, there were precious few places like it anywhere in Northern Europe, and it was probably one of the, the biggest four or five permanent or semi-permanent settlements anywhere in Britain. Now, in its own limited way, London, which flourished between the 7th and 9th centuries. To trace what happened next, we would need to cast our mind's eye uh, in the other direction, east uh, from the temple, towards the formidable walls of Roman Londinium, which you can see again on the map. Now, these ramparts still stood tall and firm in the early Middle Ages, as did some of the ruins within them, although with the important exception of St Paul's Cathedral, the land enclosed by the walls had been largely empty of habitation since the end of central Roman rule in the early 5th century. That changed in the middle and later years of the 9th century, the 800s, when people started to gravitate away from the West End and into the Roman city once again. 
possibly under the pressure of Viking attacks, possibly as part of a kind of gradual uh, sort of spreading out and eastward shuffle of London Witch. Uh, there is a, a key figure who comes into play at this point, and that is Alfred the Great, the most famous Anglo-Saxon king, a prominent figure in the Last Kingdom, if anyone's been watching that. Um, his main contribution to London's history is portrayed uh, in this magnificent mural from the Royal Exchange. And this was painted in 1912 as part of a series to show heroes of the city's history. Uh, and that timing is very, very important. This was at a, this was at a time when uh, the, the body of Greater London, the administrative entity of Greater London was fairly new, and there was a lot of fear in the city that it would be absorbed within that, and it would lose its special character. So these, these murals were all part of an effort to try and show how grand and important the city had been in the history of the nation and why it deserved still to be its own special unit. Now, the Alfred we see here is not the kind of Alfred you'd get away with nowadays. Um, he looks pretty resplendent in his furs. He's surrounded by dogs and burly, scantily clad warriors with big weapons, um, the stuff of red-blooded, dark age manhood, real sort of Conan the Barbarian school of history stuff. Um, but the focal point of, of is his wave of approval uh, to what one can only assume are the architects who proudly hold up a scroll that you might just be able to make out there, which says uh, London, just in case we were in any, we were in any doubt. Um, this image is meant to represent events that we know from the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle, uh, a sort of year-by-year -year record that was kept in Old English at this point, um, of events going on in England. And it says that in 886, Alfred came to London, refurbished its defences, and used it as a base for a ceremonial submission of all the English who were not subject to the Vikings, before he entrusted it to uh, Ethelred, um, who was the leader or ealdorman of the Mercians, under Alfred's overlordship. Now London made sense as a venue for all these actions. It had historically been under Mercian dominance, uh, but it sat right on the Thames, on the boundary between Mercian and West Saxon interests, and indeed the West Saxons had been gradually encroaching more and more into the, the affairs of the city over the previous decades. Uh, moreover, as of the 880s, it was also very close to the border of Viking territory, which began where the River Lee left the Thames in what is now the Docklands. In other words, about a couple of miles away from the city. So you could have stood on the ramparts in Mercian territory, looked across the river to what's now Southwark, West Saxon territory, and then also looked east and seen very clearly Viking territory. So it's a, th a three-way frontier town at this point. Now, Alfred did not rebuild London, Londinium from scratch. But in his time, it did start to develop a much stronger unitary identity, best represented by the involvement of the city's population in the military campaigns against the Vikings. In time, it would become a, a great city, uh, growing rapidly to become a national focal point of military and financial affairs in the decades around the first millennium. And I've illustrated that here with these rather wonderful um, pictures from uh, Makoto Yukimura's uh, manga uh, all about Vinland Saga, which covers all sorts of things in the early 11th century, including the siege of London um, in the, the 1010s. And again, I wouldn't swear to the exact historicity of what London looked like and the scale at this point, but these capture, I think, uh, very well the sort of desperation and tone of what's going on at that point. And so I heartily commend these for anyone who wants to go and uh, be entertained reading about such things. There's even a, an um, animated version of them you can watch on Amazon these days. Now, the reign of the king, who was ruling at this point, Ethelred II, sometimes known as Ethelred the Unready, spanned the decades either side of the first millennium and is not remembered as a period of particular glory and victory. But, in fact, for London, it was when things really came together, making it uh, the leading the leading military, economic, and political center of the whole kingdom. Um, as these uh, lively and evocative illustrations show, um, London was the heart of Ethelred's war effort and the great prize that his enemies, the Vikings, tried many times and failed every time to seize for their own. Um, but as with Lundenwick, its status in the late 9th and most of the 10th centuries needs to be kept in perspective. 
Um, by the time of Ethelred, it was a great big city with probably well over 10, 20,000 people, um, all sorts of things centered on it. But in the age of Alfred, and for decades thereafter, uh, the growth of Ethelred's reign was still uh, a sort of, you know, a glint in the eye. Only a small portion of land within the Roman walls was occupied, um, a strip that you can see on this map, only about 300 by 1,000 metres, or 5 by 10 football pitches, um, which ran along the banks of the Thames. So it was a small area, even just of the city of London, which is a, re a pretty small area in, in, in real terms. Trading links were fewer and less wide ranging than they had been in the era of London, which crucially, London was not at this point uh, thinking about it on a national perspective, any larger or more important than any other, uh, sorry, than other important cities of the kingdom, such as Canterbury, Chester, Winchester, and York. It would only start to pull away from them in terms of scale and significance in the decades around the time of Ethelred, around the year 1000. So we go back then to this sort of formative era in between Alfred and in between that burst of growth and activity that we see around about the end of the first millennium. Uh, this era, the, the 10th century, was crucial in the shaping of London as an urban community, although paradoxically we'll see that an urban community was very much also a rural community at this point. It was not just people who lived in the city, people who identified with it. Um, and the crucial document in showing this process is the one sometimes known as the Peace Guild of London, or slightly less, less interestingly, Six Athelstan. Uh, meaning that it was traditionally identified as the sixth law code of King Athelstan's reign, um, which ran from 924 to 939. Um, though, in fact, more recent scholarship would actually count probably seven law codes from, Athelred's re from Athelstan's reign, um, and they're also a bit hesitant about ascribing all of them to him, but nonetheless, it, it gives us a chronological framework to work with. So although this was not actually a, a, a set of laws issued by the king as such, it was addressed to him, and so it must come from his reign, um, and like most Anglo-Saxon legal texts, it was originally composed in Old English, in the vernacular, the language of the Anglo-Saxons and ancestor of modern English, and you'll see a few chunks of this in, in the course of the talk. The Old English version, the, the original version, survives uniquely in a collection of legal material uh, put together at Rochester in the early 12th century in a precious manuscript known as Textus Rofensis. There's also a Latin translation um, made around the same point at the beginning of the 12th century of which several copies survive. And it's worth stressing that although these do come in in law books, they're very much sort of antiquarian collections. These weren't um, documents that were put together for direct reference. They were put together for historical interest out of a wider morass of texts that were circulating in many different forms within England um, and did not and that were not sort of systematically collected or disseminated um, in any particular way. Now uh, the Peace Guild, uh, the document that we have, consists of a series of 12 chapters on the subject of peacekeeping in and around London. The first eight of these chapters were written um, as a group with the final four added subsequently in light of further deliberations and instructions from the king, uh, which were passed back to the local community in London via representatives who'd gone to meetings convoked by the king and the Archbishop of Canterbury in other locations. Now, it emerges that what we see in this text is a two-way process of lawmaking. Local groups took responsibility for writing up and implementing their own customs in dialogue with the king. At London, there was a close convergence of royal and local interests for the prime focus of the Peace Guild and of other laws promulgated by, uh, by in the time of Athelstan and his father, King Edward the Elder, was theft. Now, this was a particularly threatening crime in Anglo-Saxon law. Most offences, including murder, um, crippling injury, rape and property damage, could be settled with compensation to the victim or their family. There was a fine to the king for certain crimes that were seen as having a kind of a degree of offence to public sensibilities, but the main expense um, people would have to pay was compensation to the victim or their family, sometimes on such a large scale that it would force offenders to go into debt slavery, uh, which was exactly what it sounded like. They had to work as a slave to 
pay off their debt, um, or they had to rely on the goodwill of friends and family to lend them the requisite money, in effect, making them liable for the offender's future good behavior. Um, Guilds could also play a role in this, and I'll come back to that later. Uh, but these large sums that people could be liable to were called wergild, uh, quite literally man price um, or life price. Uh, it was the amount your life was worth if killed or subject to some other heinous crime. Um, everyone knew how much uh, his or her own wergild was, and one king even wrote a letter to the whole people addressed uh, to those of a 1200 shilling wergild or a 200 shilling wergild, meaning aristocrats um, or uh, the mass of the, the free peasantry. But payment of compensation and fines depended on knowing who had committed the crime and being able to bring them, hopefully willingly, to justice. Um, that was why theft was so problematic. By definition, it meant the offender got away, or at least tried to, and there was no one to challenge or pay up. Heinous though other offences might be, they were in a sense open. People could normally be held to account with a clear victim uh, and perpetrator. Um, there, were, there were sometimes different categories for this. Um, so anonymous theft and its parallel, homicide, or as the Anglo-Saxons called it, morth, hence murder, meaning concealed killing, um, ran the risk of sowing suspicion and distrust with, within communities, whereas another crime they, they had rear flack, like, like reaving, ravaging, that was just taking stuff openly. So again, they didn't like it, but you could proceed through the courts in a fairly straightforward way. Um, this was why both kings and local communities like the Peace Guild regarded theft as an especially insidious and threatening danger, meriting harsher treatment than other offences like murder or rape. The Peace Guild and other laws of the same period say that thieves who were caught in the act could expect death, um, their property being confiscated to pay for the lost goods. And then the surplus split between the thief's wife, assuming she was not complicit, uh, the king and the guild itself. The rhetoric of these laws was utterly merciless. All those over the age of 12 were liable to death if they stole property worth 12 pence or more in value, which was a pretty considerable sum at the time. Um, and that's actually the very first clause of the Peace Guild's, the, the Peace guild statutes. Of course, People confronted with a, a frightened child or a desperate neighbor or relative were perhaps inclined to second thoughts. A case narrative from the opening years of the 10th century describes how a minor aristocrat from Wiltshire had his powerful relatives intervene to get him through two accusations of theft without anything like this ever happening. And in the Peace Guild itself, chasing and slaughtering pre-teens for theft was apparently seen as a step too far, even for Anglo-Saxon justice, as one of the clauses added on at the end says that King Athelstan himself thought it was a bit too much for young people to be killed for these crimes, so he ordered that only people over 15 would be executed for theft unless they, were, unless they resisted when they were caught, in which case anyone of any age was fair game. Now, the scenario the Peace Guild seems to picture is that someone realized that they had been the victim of a theft and immediately raised the alarm with their neighbors, there being no independent police force to pursue wrongdoers at this point. A posse would then be put together to follow the tracks of the thief. Uh, that posse would then go into any jurisdiction, demanding the help of local officials as they went. Those who had horses would bring them along for the chase. Violence was part and parcel of this self-driven policing. Indeed, the Peace Guild encouraged and condoned it, offering a bounty of 12 pence to whoever actually killed the thief. Importantly, it also proudly proclaimed the heroic sounding policy that no matter who did the deeds which avenged the injury of us all, we were all in one friendship and in one enmity, whichever should result. Um, and you can see that on the, on the screen in front of you. Uh, Dida deda sethi dida, that ura ealra tionan ratche, that we war on eala swa on anum friendship, swa on anum feonship, swa huather hitona wara. The point with these provisions was to encourage members to take direct action and protect them against reaction in the compensation based world of Anglo Saxon law. That is to say, they should not be put off by the prospect of having to pay compensation to the family of a thief because the responsibility would be shared by the whole guild. 
Protection was through force as well as through force of law. The London Peace Guild genuinely did expect to pursue and confront thieves, whatever dark corner of the home counties they might flee to. The statutes say that if they were confronted with a powerful family, noble or common, um, who resisted them, they would simply bring more men and also the local official or reeve who was responsible for implementing royal commands in the area. In other words, the Peace Guild meant business. The actual goods um, being stolen, oops, sorry, there we go, uh, are mainly described using the Old English word feoch, uh, which is the origin of our word fee, um, so money, but it's also related to the German uh, via, um, V-I-E-H, meaning cattle. Uh, and this is a perennial problem in Old English, as well as other languages, including Latin and others, um, that early terms for money are the same as terms for cattle or livestock, and sometimes other basic commodities as well, which tells you something about what these societies thought really mattered in terms of wealth and its measurement. In principle, the theft of, of feoch in the Peace Guild could mean almost anything, money or animals. Though there are hints that the writers thought mainly of livestock, um, since when they offer compensation to victims of theft, they give fixed values for cattle, pigs and sheep. One does, of course, wonder how the rustling of livestock squares with the emphasis on rapid pursuit. It's, it's, I grew up in the countryside and it's, I can tell you it's very hard to make a quick getaway if you've got a cow or a flock of sheep to try and hurry along. Probably animal thieves would not get far, but the possibility remains open of chases in pursuit of other stolen goods. And we know that there was some theft of animals from documents from other places. It's, it's really interesting and quite arresting to think that London and its immediate environs in the 920s and 930s were so concerned with the theft of farm animals. Uh, one more indication of how very different urban communities were at this time, with agriculture and animal rearing being a major concern alongside trade and craft, even probably within the walls of London, using all that open space. What happened next, once a thief had been caught, is left somewhat less clear. The Peace Guild statutes are all about tracking and apprehending thieves, and the expectation was that normally they will be able, the Peace Guild would be able to judge guilt on the spot. Presumably that meant the thief would be recognisable or perhaps in possession of recognisable stolen goods, such as, you know, this fancy looking cow or, pe or pig that, that I know, know, know and love. Or else that the Peace Guild felt confident enough in their own protection to strike first and ask questions later. One of the added passages at the end suggests that after composing the main part of the text, the Londoners decided to include allowance for cases where guilt was not immediately apparent and could not, in the words of the text, be ascertained uh, on radinga, uh, literally in, in haste. Um, precious little is known about Anglo-Saxon trials for criminal offences such as theft, the problem is that there is a deep cleavage between our two main sources for Anglo-Saxon law. Law codes or programmatic normative descriptions of what should happen, like the Peace Guild statutes, and then we have narratives of actual cases. Because the narratives tend to be preserved alongside the land records of monastic houses, surviving lawsuit texts overwhelmingly concern disputes over land. And that might be one reason why they never directly cite law codes at all, um, which focus on different kinds of issues such as theft. Nonetheless, a little can be surmised about what went on in trials. First, there were no dedicated professional courts, judges or lawyers. Instead, cases were heard before assemblies of free, notable people from the surrounding area. At every level, um, from what came to be called the Hundred, to the Shire, to the King's Own Court. That, that network, that hierarchy was only formalized in the period after the, the Peace Guild was put together. At this point, things are a lot more fluid. There were areas with their own courts, but those probably overlapped to some degree. There was a possibility of um, different, different jurisdictions rubbing up against each other, as indeed we get hints of from the text itself. So basically we have a lot of different areas which all do their own thing. There's no overarching system tying them together, just broad similarities in practice with a lot of variations in terms of how that would be interpreted and elaborated on a local level. 
it's a little bit now the, the it's, it's a little bit like if modern borough or county council meetings also served as law courts and had nothing to do with each other in terms of how they actually implemented the law. The process varied depending on the case as well as on the status of the parties involved. Often the real issue was to decide which of the disputants was closer to the oath, ada thas thinear, um, meaning that they could proceed to make a formal sworn assertion of the truth of their version of events, supported by a range of character witnesses. Um, and sometimes that range of character witnesses could include the sort of, you know, best and the brightest in the land, you know, bishops, archbishops, members of the royal family, and so on. Um, if the accuser was closer to the oath, then the accused was basically guilty, and that was that. If the accused was closer to the oath, they could proceed to what was called an oath of exculpation, which was basically a, a formal proclamation of, in of innocence. And the accuser might then be held liable in turn for having brought a false accusation. However, many accounts of disputes show that in fact, a settlement was reached before or immediately after the oath, meaning that the loser did not suffer the full impact of their defeat. Rather, the point was to arrive at a solution everyone could live with and therefore be willing to accept because otherwise, again, with no police force, it was extremely hard to make judgments stick. But that did lead, leave to one side another category of case where the question was more about the veracity of what the defendant claimed. And there was, wasn't any way to be sure one way or the other. That must have been the situation faced by the Peace Guild and their accused thieves. Contemporaries could and did use visual material evidence, if any presented itself. Um, in the, uh, the, the case I mentioned before from Wiltshire in the 900s, um, one detail is that the, the thief, while trying to get away with a bunch of cattle, is forced to flee through a hedge and cuts his face in the process. Um, and so this is then an obvious signal of his culpability that people point to when he's then hauled up in court subsequently. But more often than not, there was nothing like this to go on. Um, in such circumstances, the assembled company would turn to what were called ordeals. These were physical tests designed to invoke a supernatural decision on guilt or innocence. Uh, things like pick, picking up a heated rod of iron and then waiting a few days to see whether the wound festered or healed. If it healed, God favored the person and they could go free. Um, if it became infected, the person was judged guilty. Though interestingly, um, they did not usually suffer execution, even for a, a, a crime that would normally incur it. Um, there seems to have been a lingering sense of uncertainty and diminished culpability for someone who had taken an ordeal, even if it went against them. Uh, so those who failed an ordeal simply had to pay their own war guild. A lot of money, but it's not execution. The Peace Guild statutes do not actually say that suspected thieves were subject to an ordeal, just that if they were found guilty and liable, Fool and Schildi in Old English, note the similarity to German again, uh, then their lord and family were liable to cover their wehrgeld and serve as guarantors of their future good behaviour, um, perhaps leaving the way open for future for either ordeals or other ways of determining guilt. Now, this is all plausible inference from other texts, but the silence on legal arrangements beyond the Peace Guild's right to pursue, detain and punish is an obvious missing link um, in the Peace Guild, um, a bit like Sherlock Holmes's Dog in the Night that's only notable because it fails to bark. Now, several things could be going on here. On the one hand, the statutes as we have them are a good reflection of current concerns of the king. Theft was a major worry of Athelstan's other legislation, so the Londoners were hitching themselves to a turbocharged bandwagon. We need to remember that this is a very royally oriented document, the core part of the text ending with a direct appeal to the king to offer amendments or suggestions as he sees fit. On the other, there must already have been systems in place for dealing with all the other necessities and processes that the statutes imply. The guild itself could have constituted a kind of assembly um, where these cases might be heard. In other words, it was also its own court. Um, it was both police and court, basically. Uh, but this leads us then to the question of what kind of entity the Peace Guild was and what kind of city it was based in. The first thing to emphasize is that there was technically no one Peace Guild. The statutes refer to the organization in the plural, Peace Guilds, 
um, though manifestly these operated as a single whole. Um, and you might have noticed I'm using the spelling G-I-L-D. That's just to try and emphasize the distance from the, the later medieval and indeed modern guilds, which are spelled with a U. These, these organizations are very different. They've got nothing to do with occupations um, and trades. They're, they're much more kind of fluid personal or religious organizations. Now, it's likely that the multiple guilds that the, the statutes are referring to here were divisions into units of 10 or 100 individuals that are referred to at one point in the text. These were meant to be monthly, sorry, there were meant to be monthly meetings between the leaders of those 100 units. Um, and it's possible that there were 12 of them, because the statutes then say that the 12 men should retire to have dinner together. If that's right, it would mean a notional membership of over 1,200 people. Um, now, not everyone in London would have been a member, and not all members lived in London. At the very outset, in the sort of prefatory part of the text, we are told that the Guild consists of those who belong or pertain to London, not those who live in London, an important distinction, um, which implies that some of its members live outside the walls of the city, though probably not very far afield. At several points, the text also refer refers rather vaguely to a, a boundary for the peace guild's jurisdiction and to reeves who pertain to what they called shiru uh, and this word of course is the the um the ancestor of shire um but at this date it might be a false friend we cannot be sure if it referred to the familiar shires of middlesex surrey essex and so forth uh, a shear could be any area of jurisdiction um, large or small and it only became tied specifically to shires bigger units at a later date it is known that the Eastern Middle Saxons and the, the Southern District, or Ye, uh, or, or Sa uh, Surrey, Surrey meant, um, had been important divisions in the vicinity of London since the 7th and 8th centuries. And these are all possibilities for what the Peace Guild claimed as its turf, um, especially Middlesex. But the area the Peace Guild claimed could have been a lot smaller. Um, one possibility is the walled city itself, though it's odd that there is no reference to walls, just a more generic boundary. Another is what later became the Middlesex Hundred of Osselston, um, which extended north up to what's now Barnet and west to Isleworth. In any case, the fact that the Peace Guild had a, a patch of territory that it saw as home, its, its own jurisdiction, suggests an organisation with a strong sense of territorial identity that was centred on the city, even if it extended into the countryside around the walls. This is one more reminder that we are emphatically not dealing with an urban guild of the sorts that gave rise to the 110 livery companies of London. The lineage that takes us from one to the other is not that direct, so hence we have to gain that U as we move through the Middle Ages. London in the early 10th century was a town, but one where the inhabitants would also farm and raise animals, including within the walls, with a strong common cause with people who lived in much the same way in the surrounding countryside. And we need to, we need to set aside our expectations of urban versus rural and recognise London as a focal point as much as an agglomeration or, or unit of people itself. Now, the Peace Guild stands apart from livery companies in several other ways. The city guilds were, uh, at least historically, jealous of membership, um, the later ones that is, uh, and the privileges that went with it, including the citizenship of London. Conversely, the Peace Guild was a surprisingly open body. Um, in the opening address, we are told that the statutes have been agreed by reeves and bishops, um, as well as the whole membership, um, both noble and common. Ye um, yorlisha, ye chirlisha, as in churlish, like peasantish. The main requirement of membership seems to have been a willingness to participate in keeping the peace. There was also an annual subscription of four pence. But this could be waived for poor widows, which is important as evidence that there were, or at least could be, women who joined in their own right and served as members of the organization. Fourpence was hardly peanuts in the 10th century, but it also was also not a prohibitive sum. Clearly, there was an expectation that members would vary in wealth. If, for example, a slave ran away but was caught, they would be stoned to death. And this nastier penalty reflects the slave's lower social status and compensation would be paid to the former owner, but only by other slaveholders who would give a halfpenny or penny each, depending on the number of members that there were in the guild at that time, which suggests that that might vary. 
Similarly, those who owned houses were expected to ride, who, sorry, who owned horses were expected to ride them in pursuit of thieves, while those who did not have horses were expected to do the work of those who left and look after their property. This is not to say that the Peace Guild was an egalitarian body. Quite the contrary, it included people of diverse status and existed to protect and advance their interests and preserve their position relative to outsiders. But it was unusual in bringing together such a socially diverse body of people united, it seems, in common legal cause and suspicion of their neighbours. It was in some ways like a neighbourhood watch group that took up arms and declared itself to be a police force, or one of the militias seen in certain US states that decided that its territory was now a county. Um, the Peace Guild demonstrates that there were more routes to formal legal authority than designations imposed from above. It is probably just one instance of something that was happening widely in 10th century England, as informal structures and organisations were co-opted into the emerging uh, mechanisms of the state as hundreds and shires and the officials and groups who dominated them. In time, these mechanisms would stick and become formalised under more uniform terminology, but that development lay sometime in the future um, in the era of the Peace Guild. Um, the organization, this organization is unusual as part of this story only in being a guild, um, a spontaneous voluntary association that cut across existing ties of kinship and lordship, though doubtless it also incorporated many such smaller knots of loyalty. There is no sense that being a guild was in any sense subversive or challenging to the ruling authorities, and the range of powers it claimed was really not as exceptional. Um, it can be set alongside other examples of interpersonal associations in early medieval Europe that made a transition from informal to formal power, as if the mafia gradually became a local council. Indeed, the ruling bodies of towns in northern Italy in the 11th and 12th centuries are a case in point of exactly this kind of transformation, as the old poles of royal or imperial authority withered and died away, and less formal local assemblies took over. So on one level, um, the London Peace Guild can be set alongside lots of other voluntary organisations, usually sworn or pledged, that existed across early medieval Europe based on people who lived in or near the same city, or who shared a connection to the same saint or church, for example. These groups had diverse devotional, administrative, economic and even military functions, and could easily slide from one of these to another, or several others for that matter, just as they could move from informal status to formal as a political and legal authority, which indeed was what the, the Peace Guild seemed to be doing. In that sense, the Peace Guild fits clearly into a bigger picture, but on another, it was something very special. Only rarely can moments of transition like we see here be witnessed as a self-proclaimed association boldly and apparently successfully claims its place in law enforcement. Within England, the Peace Guild and its status form part of a recognisable tradition of Anglo-Saxon guilds. Now, the word guild was originally to do with money and paying, like uh, the German Geld, for example, and probably refers to the members paying into a common fund for mutual protection and conviviality. In the first ever record of guilds in Anglo-Saxon England, as part of a, a law code from Wessex issued around the year 700, this was precisely the role guilds played. Uh, this law code says that ye gildan, guild members, come out, get, were, uh, were uh, or co-payers, it perhaps might be better read as, were people who stepped in as a kind of substitute or supplementary family in legal disputes. It is not clear whether these early ones were ad hoc groups put together just for a single legal case, um, a bit like what I mentioned before, where you'd need to go around the houses to get people to help pay your, your compensation, um, or else they were more stable and lasting associations that could look after one another through several different legal, legal challenges. But by the ninth century, guilds were referred to as witnessing land transactions in Kent, so they clearly had a degree of stability by that time. Other guilds are referred to casually in various contexts from across England in the 10th and 11th centuries, and they were evidently very common. At Exeter Cathedral, in fact, uh, a series of lists was put together in the decades just after the Norman Conquest, so probably 1070s or so, and these describe no fewer than 14 one four guilds, uh, each consisting of between 12 and 44 members. 
All of these guilds were formed in villages that were near Exeter, some of which had two or even three guilds in them. Um, but all of these villages lay outside the direct jurisdiction of its cathedral. Um, the guilds thus represent people who entered into a voluntary supplementary relationship with the nearby cathedral, the most prestigious church of the area, that involved offering small amounts of money and prayer. Now, comparison of these lists with the records relating to the same villages in Doomsday Book, um, the famous inquest on who owned what property in the 1080s, shows a close, often in fact an exact match, between the numbers of people in each village guild and the number of peasants recorded in that village in 1086, meaning that the whole adult population of these villages might have been members of guilds of this kind. So that's a very important point, suggests just how common and deep rooted these, these organizations were. Now the Exeter Peasant Guilds flag up a second crucial function that we can set alongside the monetary one. Guilds in early medieval England had an important religious flavor to them. They structured prayer and charity and crucially also funerals of members. Um, and there were two other key roles that we can single out. One of them was feasting, partying. Uh, guild, guilds and their members knew how to have a good time, sometimes perhaps too good of a time. In the 790s, uh, the Northumbrian expatriate scholar Alcuin wrote letters admonishing the archbishops of Canterbury and York on problems in England, and one of these was the popularity of what he called conventicula, little gatherings in Latin, um, and these groups would take to the hills for boozy hiking parties that undercut church attendance and obedience to local bishops. So he was the fan. As late as the 12th century, English guilds had a reputation across Europe for a distinctly hard partying brand of spirituality. The final role that stands out for early medieval English guilds was protection for members against violence and legal action, the two being closely related. Um, this has already, of course, been mentioned in relation to the Peace Guild, which is very concerned, primarily concerned with that side of things. But it's worth emphasizing that violence was not necessarily quite as endemic or serious as these statutes seem to imply at first glance. The point of these robust provisions was precisely to discourage action against members. The London Peace Guild ticks all of these boxes. Violence and protection we've heard about. There were also common funds held by the leaders of each 10 or 100 unit to be used for paying compensation and bounties for those who were the first to kill thieves. The feasting element comes in with the meetings of the designated heads of the 10 and 100 units, and one suspects that the others would get their day of beer and meat as well. Religious devotions are less prominent in the Peace Guild statutes, but they are there. Uh, the leftovers of guild feasts were to be distributed to the Christian poor, and on the death of a guild member, all were to offer a loaf of bread or pay for a priest to say 50 psalms. The Peace Guild of London can be compared most closely to four other English guilds that are known from sets of statutes written in the 10th and earlier 11th centuries, um, all of them in Old English. These highlight what was special about the London Peace Guild. Um, these four other texts include one, one more from Exeter, written about a century before the peasant guilds I mentioned a moment ago. There's one from Cambridge, one from Great Bedouin in Wiltshire, and one from Abbotsbury in Dorset. Two of these come from rural settings, and the others both probably concern people who live in the area around the urban focal points of Cambridge and Exeter. They do not necessarily reflect the highest elite, but certainly those uh, with a significant amount of disposable income. And the Cambridge Guild is explicitly framed as a guild of thanes. Uh, thane at this point being sort of like knights or gentry um, in the later Middle Ages, people who are on the cusp of the elite. The Cambridge statutes are like those of the Peace Guild in having a strong interest in disputes and their settlement. Another interesting point of contact between the Cambridge Guild and that of London is how they relate to higher authorities, including the King. The Peace Guild is openly cast as a bid for royal approval, while the Cambridge Guild demanded that members rally to support one another in time of illness, death or crisis, but it made an exception to those demands on loyalty and mutual support if members were busy or preoccupied with service to the King, the Elderman or the Bishop. 
This is a point that separates the English guilds from their counterparts in contemporary mainland Europe, especially in the Carolingian era of the 8th and 9th centuries, where guilds, um, coniurationes, coup swearings, as they were known in Latin in Carolingian texts, uh, were known with, a, were, sorry, were treated with a great deal of suspicion and circumspection by the king and his agents. One law from the 880s uh, specifically forbade peasants from forming guilds to uphold their legal claim in the face of abuse from others, which is precisely what the London Peace Guild proclaimed its purpose to be. So very interesting contrast to make here. Um, in England, there, it's quite all right to form a group to assert that you and your, your neighbours can do your own thing, whereas that's emphatically what people are being told not to do 30 or 40 years earlier in, in France and Germany. Um, in this respect, all the English guilds, which openly and proudly made their own statutes, worked in a quite different tradition that allowed for collaboration between king and diverse self-proclaimed and largely self-regulating local groups. So what then stands out as distinct about London's Peace Guild? Uh, it comes off as being unusually large and unusually focused on legal and violent matters compared to the others. Um, the Peace Guild statutes were also the longest set of guild regulations from early medieval England, and the only one that clearly received additions after its first drafting, at which point it presumably existed in the form of a book or pamphlet. Possibly for these reasons, the Peace Guild was also distinct in how its statutes were preserved, being regarded by later readers as part of the corpus of law codes, whereas the other sets of guild statutes survived essentially by chance as additions to holy books, or in one case written out on a loose leaf of parchment, like a charter. Um, it's the one from Abbotsbury in the middle up here. And the other thing that you might be able to see that's interesting with the Great Bedouin one um, is that in fact, the guild statutes just, just stop mid sentence. We don't know why, but whoever uh, was, worth, was putting those together got distracted and never finished their job. Um, so yes, the other ones are preserved as uh, sort of asides in holy books and on single sheets. In practice, the Peace Guild statutes, as well, all the Guild statutes have material in common, um, and with some, and the Peace Guild also crosses over with royal law codes, particularly with regard to theft and its prosecution, as I said before. Um, Finally, and perhaps most importantly, the Peace Guild is exceptional in being such an elaborate and ambitious, yet also spontaneous bottom-up organization. Um, in that respect, it tells us much about London and about how its character as a defined urban community was coming together and asserting itself in the eyes of the king and against aggressors in the surrounding countryside. Um, the inhabitants willingness to ride out and challenge malefactors may well be related to the military measures put in place to deal with the Viking raiders in the late ninth century. And in fact, riding out to challenge groups of Vikings is precisely what we hear about Londoners doing in the 880s and 890s. Now, all of this depends, of course, on the Peace Guild actually doing what it set out to do in its statutes. And here lies the rub. We simply have no idea if the Peace Guild did all of this or whether it did anything. There are no references whatsoever to the Peace Guild beyond these statutes. So was it simply a paper tiger, a grand idea that never made it past the drawing board? We can probably infer that something like the regulations, uh, like what the regulations envisage existed for a while in the 930s because of the sequence of the additions made to them at the end. Um, these represent proclamations from two larger meetings of Reeves and Eldermen, one of them held at Thunderfield in Surrey and the other at Whittlebury in Northamptonshire, late in King Athelstan's reign. So someone was actively updating the document at that point, basically. But there were no further additions made after Athelstan died in 939. One possibility is that this kind of super guild, which was bigger and more proletarian in its, in its makeup than those other four we just looked at, um, that was, it was only ever meant to be a temporary body created to implement Athelstan's struggle against theft. Another possibility is that like the examples of informal or quasi-formal bodies becoming more solid features of the governmental landscape, the Peace Guild, or at least elements of the Peace Guild, did survive, but in a modified form as part of the highly idiosyncratic governance of medieval London. 
Sorry, I'm missing a couple of slides there. Never mind. Um, when London's administrative organs first started to emerge in the 11th and 12th centuries, it was already an unusual place. Three features stand out. One was that it sat outside the system of shires, in effect being its own shire, although from the first, London also dominated the small adjoining county of Middlesex. Second, London was divided up into an unusually large number of internal units, or wards as they were called, with the full complement of 24 that made up the geography of the city until 1394, and there's only been one added since then. There are still 25 wards and there have been 25 since 1394 when Farringdon was divided into two. Um, and those had 24 had probably been there since at least the early 12th century, um, which is when a number of them are first referred to. Third, London had two assemblies or courts, uh, the folk moot that met three times a year and consisted of all three citizens, and the much smaller husting, uh, which still exists and met more frequently and dealt with more specific and demanding cases. Um, other English towns only had one assembly that was analogous to the folk moot. Some of these features could well go back to the era of the Peace Guild. London was, after all, still a fairly young community at that point, so it is difficult to make a case for anything that goes back much earlier, while it had a continuous existence thereafter. The break between a select husting and a larger folk moot might go back to the Peace Guild's managing clique of hundredmen and tidesmen, men who, who were in command of the tens, compared to the entire body of members. No general gathering um, is, is referred to in the Peace Guild statutes, though it is likely that at least one took place each year, and this may have been where the thieves who were not caught red-handed had, had to be tried. It is true that the term husting is not used in the ordinance of the Peace Guild at any point. Uh, this word has sometimes been argued to be of Old Norse derivation, um, and therefore a result of when the Vikings were a major presence in the city. Um, in that case, it would come from the term husting, um, meaning a meeting held in a house, um, kind of as it sounds like, uh, thing being uh, a bit like thingvetlir in Iceland or tingwald in the Isle of Man. That, that word means a, a, a meeting, a deliberative body. Another possibility that's been suggested is that it comes from huskarla thing, uh, meaning a meeting of housecarls or household, elite household troops. Since the Vikings only became a, a settled presence in London after the year 1000, this would probably rule out a connection with the Peace Guild, uh, unless of course a pre-existing body had taken on a new name. But husting could just as well be an Old English term, hus thing, which is also perfectly plausible in Old English. And there is in fact a document referring to the husting of London that dates from 985 or before, so when the Vikings would not have been a, a real presence in London. In fact, that document has sometimes been seen as a forgery precisely for the rather circular reasoning that it refers to the husting. Theoretically, then, London could have had a husting, a meeting associated with a house, for a long time before the Viking presence in the early 11th century. And from a charter of the early 1100s, we know that this was very literally what the husting consisted of, a gathering of notables in the house of one of their number, where the business in question was discussed and concluded. The injunction of the Peace Guild that its leaders should meet over drink and food and then retire together to dine probably implies a similar arrangement if focused on the convivial element of proceedings rather than what was actually talked about. So again, it would be an example of something that's sort of semi-informal, takes on a much more concrete function, but remains basically a dinner party where you hear court cases. What about the wards of the later city? Some of these can be argued to go back to what were occasionally called soaks, S-O-K-E, soaks. Uh, these were areas of loose seigneurial jurisdiction that went back to large and otherwise broken up estates of early times. So even by about the year 1000, these would have been an archaism and it was just a kind of lingering set of, of minor perquisites that a lord who was in charge of a soak still had, but these could be the way of creating other kinds of personal relationships or kinds of dependence. Um, so th th these might have been one of the ingredients going into the wards, um, but that cannot explain all of them. And the word ward itself comes from Old English weard, W-E-A-R-D, meaning guard or protection. Um, so implying probably uh, a military or peacekeeping function. 
There may be a connection here with the hundreds into which the Peace Guild was divided. We do not, of course, know the names of these or even if they were strictly territorial units. Moreover, they probably extended over a larger area than the later city territory. But the similarities in function are striking, and it is certainly plausible that some of the wards represent intramural hundred units from the time of the Peace Guild, joined by others over time as different kinds of unit and land holding were formed and built up. There is also the issue of London's unusual position relative to the shires. Um, this was already in place by the time of Doomsday Book in the 1080s, when London was allocated a separate section of its own that was never filled in, um, which would imply that it was, in a sense, a kind of shire, um, while its dominance over Middlesex was formalised in the early 1100s, but can be traced back, at least intermittently, into the 1040s, when one Port Reeve of London, that is, an official responsible for upholding royal interests in the city or port, also held the office of Sheriff of Middlesex. And that was exactly what happened later on, that the Sheriff of London and the Sheriff of Middlesex were both functionaries of the city government. Again, it is plausible that the existence of a distinct administrative entity, the Peace Guild, centered on London, lies behind this arrangement. Um, basing the administration of a rural territory so strongly on a town was actually quite unusual in early medieval England. Other English shires, even those containing important towns like Hampshire, Lincolnshire and Yorkshire, had a more dispersed series of central places of assembly and governance. And essentially separate London and Middlesex could have been a result of reconciling the Peace Guild with the emerging system of more regular shires, essentially a, a way to recognize the existing arrangement based on the city with a more securely territorial unit beyond. Alternatively, London could have been hived off from Middlesex in the years around 1000, when it became a key base for the military efforts and financial machine of King Ethelred II. London's Peace Guild may not have had an obvious or direct legacy, but a good argument can be made that parts of it survived to become core elements of the city's governing infrastructure, some of which, not least the Court of Husting, still survive to this day. It can equally be looked at as a fascinating artifact of its own time, the 10th century. The Peace Guild leads us to think about the nature of the society that made it and of the laws and legal systems available for keeping the peace. If anything, keeping the peace comes across as a paramount concern um, because it was something that had to be done with a great deal of effort. Um, this Anglo-Saxon term, frith, um, peace, it didn't just mean absence of trouble, it meant active assertion to try and keep the peace. It was something you had to strive for. Um, and we don't hear much from the Peace Guild about other kinds of activities and functions. Keeping that peace, keeping the frith was what everyone was worried about. We see in the Peace Guild a reflection of the anxieties and potential of early medieval English society as a network of people and communities who could claim their own legal jurisdiction under loose overall royal leadership. The Londoners, in short, were already looking to their own resources for peace and protection. Thank you very much. Rory, hmm. thank you very much indeed. That was absolutely fascinating. I, I wish I'd been able to take it all in. <laughs> but, um, as Kate said at the beginning, this is going to be available for those who would like to. And may I just ask, in your book, um, in your 2018 book hmm. uh, about uh, the early London, the rise of early London. Yes. Do you deal with all this? I do, not in not in quite the, the details I went into this evening, but I've written another another article that's on the the um, further reading that I, I sent in where I, I go into all of this, particularly the relationship between the Peace Guild and the later elements of the city government. Thank you. And and may I just ask, we come now to to questions, if we may. Mm -hmm. uh, may I just ask you, was the situation fairly similar all over the country? Um, that's a very good question. I think the chances are more similar than we realize. 
uh, I think that the way in which people dealt with things like theft and other crimes, you know, forming these little groups who go off chasing, chasing criminals, I think that was probably very similar. I think having a, a sort of guild that, that undertook that role was probably less common. I wouldn't necessarily say it's unique, but London is the only example that we know of where a guild did all of that. Fascinating. Yes. Thank you very much. Well, then, may I just ask Kate? Kate, we've got some questions. Yes. Did you, are you, are you happy just to click on the Q&A at the bottom and they'll ping up for you so you can read them or do you want me to do them? Um, would you mind doing them? And I, I will read them out. So we've got a question from John Wilson. Was the Guild a text as shown or, or a group of people that administered or enforced it? That's a good question. Um, we only have the text to go on, so in a sense, that's all we have. But my my working premise is that it was um, also the group that the text is what we have, and the group more or less followed or tried to follow the rules as it was set down. Thank you. Then Greg Dory, our sub treasurer, says aside from any similarity of the original model. Were there any known links between the English and continental European guilds during the period covered by your lecture? Um, in terms of direct links, not that I know of. You know. There weren't any people that we know of who were members of, of both or anything like that. Um, but there were a lot of similarities in terms of, in terms of function. Um, so I mentioned how they had a lot to do with, with prayer, connections with churches things like that um, this is something that you can see very strongly on both sides of the channel uh, you can also see there's a lot of emphasis on um, on basically partying and feasting there's a wonderful passage in a set of um, uh, a set of proceedings from a, a meeting of priests in the the diocese of, of Rams in the mid 9th century where they talk about the the raucous parties that some of these guilds have been getting up to where people have had dancing bears and masks of demons and they've been drinking in the names of all sorts of people they shouldn't be drinking in the names of it sounds like a hell of a good time much more so than you normally find <laughs> like in the in these rather rather dry sounding texts you know there's a lot of liveliness going on behind them Yes, yes. It doesn't sound quite like the decorum of courts today. <laughs> um, yes, there's, there's an interesting uh, question from uh, Rebecca Warren. Mm. Was there a link between the activities of the Peace Guild mm. and the process of compurgators? Compurgators are the oath helpers that you oh. told us about. That's right. Um, again, I suspect so, but this isn't actually something that the text goes into. They focus much more strongly on basically how you get your man and what happens next is, is assumed to be something that everyone knows about. They don't, they don't need to set down for the king to, to understand. Um, but yes, I suspect that if they did haul someone in uh, and there was a question over there uh, over whether they'd committed the crime or if there was time for that person to sort of send the word out, then yes, I suspect there would have been a bunch of these, these character witnesses who would turn up and say that actually this person is a very good thing and please don't kill them. Um, because that's simply the way Anglo-Saxon law seems to have worked otherwise. There was lots of emphasis put on the oath helpers, compurgation, as, as we've discussed here. Um, so, in short, I suspect yes, but it's not something the text tells us about directly. Then a, an interesting question, did you have to be a member of the guild to have a remedy? Uh, and what, did, what law did you resort to if you were not a guild member? Well, that's a, a very good question from, uh, from Ted. Um, I, I think yes, it does sound like you had to be a member. Uh, to claim this this protection and help against against theft, uh, that seems to be the whole premise of the Peace Guild. If you weren't a guild member and you lived in the District of London, that's a good question. One assumes there was a kind of um, sort of I wouldn't quite use the term public option, but a sort of existing system in place that presumably you could still try and bring a, th a, a thief to justice yourself. 
and haul them up in in the local court as the peace guild itself was doing you just wouldn't have the help of your fellow guild members in doing it and you also wouldn't have the possibility of support if um you were then charged with killing someone you know that's the reason why they're putting all that stuff about we we you know we're all in one enmity we're all in one heroic action in other words if somebody kills the baddies if somebody kills a thief then we'll all chip in and support them if if, if uh, charges are placed and perhaps arising out of that is there a direct connection between the mm. guilds and the hue and cry mm. which of course went on for years it, it, indeed it's probably not still quite dead no, I think that's right. I think, again, it's not something which is formalized, but yes, I think it's implicit in the way the Peace Guild seems to anticipate these pursuits working, that somebody would realize, oh, eek, my favorite cow has been taken. At that point, they they go out and they tell their neighbors that, you know, we need to go out and, and, and you know, rescue Dobbin. And uh, they get together. If they have horses, they will bring them and off they will go. So, yes, effectively, it is the hue and cry. Um, they just don't use that term for it. Um, uh, another interesting question, what was the relationship between the guilds and the freemen of the City of London and meeting responsibilities? Are there any links with the inns of court? I don't <laughs> um, think the inns of court were in existence by then. No, alas, I, I, I don't think there is any link. And the main reason for that is that at this point, there's no evidence that England had uh, a sort of professional legal class there, there like i said there were no lawyers it was basically people who knew how courts worked people who were good at doing things in court but otherwise were aristocrats landholders people who did other kinds of jobs so people would know about the law in fact most people would know about the law to some degree but uh, there was no one whose particular responsibility that was um, so in that respect, the inns of court, I'm afraid, don't really don't really feature in uh, the connection with the freemen of the city of London. Well, this isn't quite like what you see in the later Middle Ages um, and indeed subsequently where um, citizenship is tied to being a, a member of a guild um, or a company. Uh, it's there is, I suppose, a, a, a parallel in that the peace guild expects people to be a member to claim these benefits. But the peace guild at this stage is not quite identical with the the corporation of the city as we call it now um so again functionally you can see how there is a certain parallel but whether you can draw a direct genealogical link between what the peace guild is doing and how um the the livery companies work in later times i'm i'm a bit more doubtful um a, a question which i hope i can pronounce properly from Mike Gibson, was there any read across from the laws of abdomen, the Lex Innocenti, mm. adopted by at, at the Synod of Beer? Yeah. This is a this is a, a text promulgated in seventh century Ireland to try and protect people who get caught in the crossfire of um, conflict between aristocrats. Um, it's called the full term is, is Lex Innocentium, the law of the innocent. Um, and the character behind this is an abbot of Iona, um, Avabnan of Iona, he's sometimes called. Uh, again, the basic ideas are sometimes similar, that you obviously don't want bad things to happen to you, but otherwise I don't know of any direct connection that this, this Irish text, fascinating though it is, is more about protecting people who are, who are bystanders. Um, it's not so much about um, those who are actually doing the violence. In fact, those are the ones who are, are seen as the, the ones who have to watch out. Whereas the Peace Guild is really all about the rights of the people who want to go out and um, catch and rough up and potentially kill the thieves. So both of them are about violence, but take a very different perspective on it. Hmm. Another question, what, what happened to the guilds after the conquest? That's a very good question. Um, the short answer is not a great deal immediately. They were still there. They still carried on working in broadly the same way. What we can see after the Norman conquest is that they start moving towards the model that one can already see in parts of mainland Europe, which is you start to see some trade related guilds appear, merchant based guilds. Um, we hear about one of those in Canterbury um, in the years just before 1100. Um, in the course of the 12th century, 
not least in London, but in other places too, we start to hear about the first occupational guilds. Um, there are quite a number of these. They're to do with people who are butchers or um, textile workers, various things like that. Um, so I think that you start to see in the post-conquest period, guilds as we know them from later on start to become more of a phenomenon and they move away from these more social legal bodies um, of the Anglo-Saxon period. But that takes a little while. So it's really as we get to the end of the 11th century that we start to see that happening. Thank you. Well, I think we've just time. There are two more questions um, from John Stevens. Uh, to the extent that there is a commonality between the English and continental European guilds, how were ideas about the guilds likely to have been transmitted from one location to another? Well, that's a very, very good question, John. Um, I think part of the trick here is that we only have surviving for us the guild statutes from England, a few incidental references to them from um, you know, other documents like charters and so forth. Um, in continental Europe, it's even worse. We really just have law codes telling us how guilds are bad and people shouldn't shouldn't form them, and you know they were squelched by the aristocracy at this particular point. Um, this means that we only see a few sort of sort of points that we have to try and join together. Whereas, in fact, I suspect that guilds were actually much much more common than this. That essentially they were there more or less all the way through early medieval society. We have some references to them already being formed by priests in the sixth century. Um, similar organizations can be seen in the Roman period. So I think the idea of people forming um, sworn or pledged associations for all sorts of social, devotional and legal purposes was essentially as old as the hills. Um, so I think that the, the you know, basically people knew about this because it was something that we all could do or that we all knew about. Um, I, I think that probably not necessarily every single village would have everyone in a guild, but it would have been very common indeed, I think. Um, so in that sense, the, the, the ideas of what guilds could do were, were very widespread. If you put the Anglo-Saxon guild statutes alongside one, what's quite telling is that they cover a lot of similar ground. Um, in that they will all have a bit on funerals, they will all have a bit on feasting, they will all have a bit on what fines people pay if they don't fulfill their, their obligations as a member, but they don't seem to have been copied directly from each other. They put all these in different orders, they use different wording for it, so there's a very widespread idea of what a guild should be and what a guild should do, but there is not a single blueprint for what a guild, how a good guild should, um, should set those rules down. So that suggests to me that we're looking at this very broad based idea of what guilds could do that was already quite robust by the 10th century. Thank you. And, and I think finally of the questions, how much smaller were the peacekeeping organizations in other areas of the country compared to the guilds or, or were they not organizations at all? And is there any indication as to how much more effective the guilds were in peacekeeping when compared to communities or areas without them? That's a very, very good question. Um, I think that in fact, if, if you lived in an area without a guild, you'd have a court where you could come along and attempt to bring someone to justice. But what you didn't have was this network of people who would actively go out and prosecute you know, your case for you, who would try and track down and bring to justice the, the person who had, had stolen from you. Um, so in that respect, I think that the other areas would have made it a lot tougher. Uh, in these other areas, it would have been a lot tougher to make your, make your case stick. Um, were the areas smaller? I don't know. And in fact, I doubt it. I suspect that the London Peace Guild covered an area that would have been roughly similar to these other, not even, let's not say organizations, but let's say units, areas where you'd have a single uh, court, a single area of jurisdiction where you might try and bring someone to justice. Um, so I think the areas would probably have been similar in size, um, which is the same as similarly small, and also that I think the guilds would have been more effective if you were a member. Um, if you were not a member, you were probably rolling your eyes constantly at these um, ruffians from London who were racing about trying to catch everyone that thought they thought had stolen from them. So I suspect there might have been a bit of 
animosity towards the Peace Guild, um, mm. but also a lot of eagerness on the part of its members. Thank you very much. Well, that's really fascinating. I, I'm sure we could go on and on, but I think that's all, all the questions that have actually been specifically posed and time is marching on. And I do know that Guy Featherston, who are our treasurer, would like to say a few words. So may, may I invite him to do so? With huge pleasure, David. Rory, when I saw one of your titles was lecturer, lecturer in the history of England before the Norman Conquest, I thought, gosh, we're in for a treat here. And um, all the more of a treat because you have an absolute gift for colourful exposition. Yeah. Uh, you started by telling us about London Witch being akin to a car boot sale in the seventh century. <laughs> it, just, it just got better and better. You reference Conan the Barbarian, manga, Sherlock Holmes. At one stage, I heard you refer to a dinner party where you hear court cases. It was a, a rich, a colourful, vastly informative and very amusing talk. And it's a hard act to bring that corner of our deep history to life in the way that you did. At one point, I was imagining um, an Anglo-Saxon chap who's um, like Rip Van Winkle, who's woken up after 13 odd centuries of dreaming sleep and who wanders into your lecture and here, here's his own tongue being spoken. I mean, what a treat that would have been. Um, I, I thought it was really perfect, Rory, thank you. <laughs> so much. Uh, and you too, um, Master Paget, his honoured David Paget QC, you I know put a, a vast amount of work into organising these wonderful lectures, um, ably assisted by Kate Peters and Rosie Humphrey. Uh, you've done us all an immense favour this evening with your combined erudition. Um, thank you so much. Well, thank you. But uh, the erudition on my part is, is um, Pretty modest, I'm afraid, compared with Rory's. Anyway, Rory, thank you very much indeed. It's been much appreciated. And it's only sad, I think, in a way, that um, we no longer have as a compulsory subject legal history, which we used to have for the bar exams until sometime in the 1970s. I forget when. Mind you, um, I, I went to my old books before to look at what I could remember and remind myself of what I couldn't remember. Uh, and uh, we're nothing like as deep as you've taken us tonight, of course. But it's been absolutely fascinating and thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed. It's been an absolute pleasure to talk to you and uh, should anyone have any further questions, they're very welcome to email me. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you, Rory. And thanks to our audience. We, we've had vast numbers attending all the way through this talk. Uh, I hope you've enjoyed it quite as much as we have, ladies and gentlemen. And um, we look forward to seeing you at the next History Society lecture. So well, thank here, you. Here, here. And, and I do hope that uh, some members of uh, city livery companies and the city generally were, were here because of course, um, Wards still exist, all of them, as you've, as you've made clear, and aldermen still exist. Uh, and so uh, it's all very familiar territory, although uh, I don't know if a Rip Van Winkle would quite recognize it if he woke today. <laughs> anyway, it's been a fascinating evening and thank you very much indeed.